research that uh, they've been um, involved in, uh, and she's joined by uh, tax expert David. We're going to have five case studies, uh, sorry, uh, more than five case studies um, from low and middle income countries, which includes Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Canada, Rwanda, Bangladesh, and India. And we also have um, manufacturers, Putasha, uh, as well as uh, Akar Innovations joining us uh, to talk about how tax has affected them uh, uh, and the, the, uh, as well as their production as well as sale of menstrual hygiene products. And we'll open the floor to various questions. Um, so again, a very, very warm welcome to you all. We're excited that you're joining this conversation um, on this important uh, issue. I'm going to hand it over to Tanya, who's going to give us a quick overview of why should we be so bothered about this issue. Okay. Uh, thanks, Anandati. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this is Tanya Mahajan. So uh, why are we looking at tax at all? I mean, what does tax have to do with menstrual health and what role does it play? So we just wanted to quickly set the context for this discussion by going over the background and the context for uh, this movement that has taken almost the world by storm. And it's, it's, it's really been, uh, you know, we've seen the advocacy movement across different countries, not just low and middle income countries, but the US, UK, and other countries in Europe. Um, so why are we looking at tax? So what is what does taxation on menstrual products do? What does it limit? So first of all, of course, it is, uh, you know, as a wherever it's a sales tax or even a value added tax, whatever the structure might be, it is an add on to the price that is passed on uh, to the consumer. So consumers are paying a little bit extra. Menstruators are paying a little bit extra for uh, access to products uh, for managing their menstruation. But that's not it. There is also an additional uh, aspect of, uh, you know, how does tax uh, uh, affect the rest of the supply chain? So wherever there is a value added structure or even a sales tax structure, because it is, uh, you know, there is a maximum retail price that, that is uh, put on put by manufacturers on the product, uh, the amount that goes into taxation leaves just a little bit lesser for distribution across the supply chain. And wherever distribution is a challenge, especially in low and middle income countries where you have geographies which have, have you know, huge distances where you need multiple layers of distribution and retail, it leaves a little less to be shared amongst those distribution entities. So a last mile treat, retailer in you know, a village setting, uh, there may not be enough left to share with that person. So access to products in those settings gets limited. So that's why we are looking at tax in the first place. Now, it, so, so basically what, what tax on menstrual products does, it's limiting accessibility and it's limiting affordability of quality menstrual products. That's one part of it. The other part of this entire discourse is also that uh, this whole uh, discussion on taxation is in the policy, uh, you know, the policy space. So by talking about taxation in the policy space, we are normalizing menstruation in the entire policy discourse and making space for providing information on sexual and reproductive health over the reproductive life cycle. So that's sort of the uh, outcome, not the direct, but indirect outcome of this entire uh, movement on taxation. By providing awareness, normalizing menstruation, making pro quality products more accessible and affordable, what's happening is that information products and facilities for ensuring healthy, dignified, and safe menstruation becomes available for women. That's what the hypothesis is. And hence, that's, you know, that's the whole point of this entire movement. Um, looking at, but you know, it's not just an issue of uh, menstrual health itself. It's actually just, it, it's actually an issue of uh, gender equity. It's an issue of rights. Because if you look at different, uh, you know, sustainable development goals, menstrual menstruation is at the center of all of them. Uh, when you look at the SDG3 on health, uh, you know, talking about puberty, access to menstrual products is essential for universal access to SRHR services. When you're talking about education, ensuring, you know, elimination of gender disparities for ensuring that girls can go to school, can, uh, you know, 
uh, miss uh, as less days as possible uh, going to school and ensuring gender sensitive facilities uh, in schools that's again where uh, you know cost of these menstrual products becomes important talking about the sgd5 of gender equality you know when taxation is in the policy discourse when you're talking about uh, this entire topic you are allowing for informed decisions by the uh, menstruators on sexual and reproductive health aspects uh, in terms of gender equality there's also a sub topic on sgg5 which looks at laws and regulations which should be guaranteeing access to srhr ic and care and last but not the least is the sustainable production and consumption sdg which looks at reduced waste generation by allowing for uh, you know reduced taxation on sustainable menstrual products tanya Tanya? Sorry, we can't hear you anymore. Hi, Inad. So would you take us through the global research um, on tax advocacy? Sure. Yeah, happy to do so. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, I want to present you in the next uh, 10 minutes our findings from the global Scrap the Period tax campaign. Um, which was united, as you might know, as uh, the initiator of Men's Hygiene Day um, has started. And this was really made uh, possible by funding uh, through the Innovation Fund by the Reproductive Health Supply Coalition. So I was really um, thankful for that. And we also have uh, Charlotte here, if you have questions to her. Um, so the Scrap the Period Tax campaign is really um, a campaign that catalyzes the global movement to abolish taxes on menstrual supplies because we've seen there is no kind of global status overview. And that's why, why we're doing, as part of this campaign, uh, the creation of a global map uh, on current taxes in countries, um, which will enable peer pressure on governments if you see that other country has done that. Next, um, we want to support ongoing campaign and enabling other campaigns by looking at, uh, encouraging activists to connect and sharing experiences um, uh, by lessons learned from successful campaigns. And this is also something that we will do today. And lastly, this will form uh, into an advocacy guide and a website, which is called WW Period Tax. We're currently building that. It's going to be ready by end of the year. And I will give you some, on the next two slides, some um, insights. So here is the tax overview, where you see which countries have already um, zero taxed uh, menstrual products. It's in pink and blue are countries which have a reduced VAT or GST rate. For example, in Europe, where you can't go lower than a certain degree, so it's not possible to zero tax it. And uh, United States, where you have state level taxation, which uh, differs. So overall, we have now a database on taxes for 173 countries worldwide. And um, I also must emphasize on that, that um, we, that when we talk about, often talk about luxury tax, there is no luxury tax on menstrual products, technically, because it's always taxed as a, on a normal standard rate. Uh, campaigners often use the terminology luxury tax to make the case that um, other luxury items are also taxed a normal rate. So um, just a, a small heads up on that. The next slide will show you the overview of existing campaigns that we mapped. So then when you go to the map, you can get in touch. Um, for example, if you're in Nigeria and you want to start a campaign, you, you know where to align with. And we've also collected some innovative campaign examples, um, such as um, the a tampon Avengers from Australia or the tampon book, book from Germany. This is all going to be shared um, in March. Next slide. So when we started out, um, of course, the ultimate ask is to abolish unfair and often unconstitutional taxes on an item of basic necessity. I think this is all clear that there are items that are zero taxed and menstrual products should be taxed too because our period is nothing of choice. 
um, and therefore period products should be also um, uh, the taxes on them should be uh, scrapped uh, similarly on other products. Next. And we also started to have uh, another um, hypothesis, and that means abolishing taxes on menstrual products to make the types of menstrual products more affordable to women and girls. And when we started out, that was really um, where we started off. And then we had an example from Tanzania who scrapped the tax and reintroduced it later. We have that case study later, uh, also uh, coming up from Priya which said, oh, this is not that straightforward. So what we decided that we needed to have a much more deeper research into this hypothesis and see if this is true or not. And I'm going to share now uh, the key findings of this research with you. And we ask us, did the VAT removal or the reduction led to cheaper prices? If not, why not? Um, there are some aspects of looking beyond prices and uh, based on that we want to develop some recommendations for campaigners. Um, and we're going to present your, our learnings now. So the first learning was that a global and national tax system as well markets are complicated and can differ from one country to the other. And uh, campaigners are not even policymakers might not fully understand the implications for it. So advice number one, get support from a local tax expert to understand your national tax system. And luckily for this uh, web dialogue today, I'm here with David Rull, who is an international tax expert, and he's going to present some of the findings uh, later on to explain that complicated system in easy words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> so the key question was, did the VAT removal or reduction led to cheaper prices for menstrual products? And the findings are very inconsistent and there's limited robust documentation on consumer prices before and after. So there's a lot of word to mouth um, on, on this, um, but not solid research. However, the information available from some countries suggests it only has a negligible or only a small effect on the final prices, such as Tanzania, India, and um, South Africa. Um, this really equals finding on tax exemptions or removals for other consumer products and services. So we looked also uh, on other research, uh, uh, research and that really um, put that same findings on the table. However, there are some exceptions, and this is in the USA, um, which has a sales tax system. It's a bit different to VAT because it's charged at the end. So if you scrap the sales tax, it's clearly definitely noticeable immediately. And in Germany, um, where some of you might know, uh, the tax has been re uh, reduced since 1st January. And we ourselves looked at prices before and after, and we've seen a price reduction of 11%, so almost the rate that the tax removal, uh, the tax reduction was taking place. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So why, I mean, that is not a good finding. <laughs> um, so we wanted to understand uh, why, why and what are the reasons. And for that, we need to understand how the VAT system works in general, because that's the most used tax all over the world as I said, USA is an exception, but therefore we look at the VAT system and I'm hand over to David, who is our expert. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, especially to understand some pitfalls that we will explain in the next slides. I will go with you through the entire supply chain and we see what is done with VAT in each step. So we start first at the production of the raw materials you need for um, the production of menstrual products, like for example, cotton or other products. These products are produced by farmers or um, somebody like that and they sell these raw materials to factories which produce menstrual products from them. And what they charge from them is on the one side the price for the raw material and on the other side VAT already at this stage. And they do not keep the VAT but they usually pass it on to the state. So the next step then is the factory of menstrual products. The first thing they do is to claim a refund for the VAT they paid while purchasing the raw materials. This VAT in the first step we call input tax because they paid it to get hold of the materials. Um, they can claim a refund for that, so what they pay in the end is only the price for the raw materials. 
the factories themselves go on and sell the products they produce, either to middlemen or to retailer stores immediately. In every case, they also charge a price and VAT on that price. The VAT, again, they pass on to the state. Um, and now we look at the third or next step at all. So the retailers, the people selling the product in the end, the first thing they do again is to claim a refund for the input tax and to sell the product to customers. There, as you all know, they charge a price and VAT. Um, the customers, however, need to bear the VAT in the end. They cannot claim a refund. So the VAT passed on by the store is the VAT um, the state really can keep in the end. That's how the system works in generally. And I ask you to keep that, um, how, what we do with input tax in mind, because that implicates a pitfall we will discuss later on. Next slide. So um, what are the reasons why this didn't happen? So the key reason is that the reduction is turned into profit along the supply chain. Not a surprise. So whoever this is can be the producer, the middleman, the retailer, the store. Someone charges, like puts the benefit into this pocket. Um, the final price is maybe not as high as before, but it's as, not as low as expected. So, uh, yeah, an unfortunate reason. Um, yeah, next slide. The second reason is that market structure really matters. And um, that, is, uh, that comes from a study from Copenhagen Economics. Um, we looked at different uh, goods and services, and they had actually two statements, and I think they are pretty clear. In a competitive market, the VAT challenges char are passed entirely through the consumers because you still want to keep uh, be competitive in the market. In a less competitive market, the changes are not passed entirely through or not consistently through to the consumers in the short to medium run. Um, because you have a monopoly, which uh, you then can keep. And this we've seen as one of the key reasons, also for example, in Tanzania, because when you look at, for example, at the transport, uh, a step that no one really considered before because everybody looked at the producers and at the consumers but for the transport if you are the only truck and the only shop in the very remote area of tanzania you have a monopoly basically and you're able to to charge or increase your profit al uh, alongside so that was one really important learning next slide uh, yeah mm -hmm. uh, the last bit when we discuss is rather a complicated one it is about um, how you can treat the input tax we talked about a few slides before. So the producers still need to buy raw material. For example, they need to buy cotton. Um, on this cotton, if there is no exception, which is not likely because even if there is an exception later on for uh, menstrual products, there might not be one for cotton because cotton can be used for many reasons. Um, VAT needs to be paid. And the question is whether the producers can deduct this input tax they paid on purchasing the raw material. This again depends on how the exception for menstrual products is designed. There are mainly two options. One is a zero rating and another one is an exemption. It might seem the same as at first sight because in both cases consumers are not um, do not need to pay VAT. But only if there is a zero rating, the producers can deduct the input tax they paid for producing the menstrual products. If there is an exemption, they are not allowed to do that. So what happens if there is an exemption? The most likely case is that they simply will pass on the, co the cost to the consumers in the end. So they will um, put it on the price they charge in the next step because they are not willing to bear this final burden. So from this design, you can already see that there might be a difference in the product price in the end. It might not be very vast, but there might be a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Um, very quickly, that because we focus a lot on costs uh, for the consumer, but there can be other reasons why a country decided to to remove uh, or reduce the VAT. So 
Um, one option is to, uh, as an instrument, to stimulate demand for a specific product or service, uh, for example, renewable energy services. But an idea we can discuss later is maybe you want to uh, advocate for tax reduction on sustainable menstrual hygiene products like cups and washable pads to have an advantage over the others. Um, the second point is to uh, stimulate local markets and increase employment. In Zimbabwe, it was a measure to counterbalance high inflation. And particularly in Tanzania, an interesting case where they, as I mentioned, reintroduced the taxes after a year of uh, removal. Um, instead, they're now proposing uh, the reduction of corporate income tax for new investors in sanitary products. Uh, so to really stimulate that market. Um, um, and a big question I'm wishing to discuss with you later is also, so what if the price is that the price might be lowered, but is the product still affordable for the hardcore poor? And we've seen um, Kenya and Scotland and India, they did additional distribution to schoolgirls, even if they had low taxes. And also in South Africa, uh, after a really good financial study, they, they recommend additional instruments to reach the hardcore poor. Um, we're closing uh, my presentation with uh, five advices for campaigners. So the first advice, despite that it also looks a little bit uh, <laughs> not so positive, but what we've seen is that a campaign on taxes is creating a lot of attention for menstrual health and hygiene in your country. It brings in new allies from the media, activists outside the development sector who mobilizes themselves. So with a, a campaign on taxes is really creating attention on the needs of uh, people who menstruate. The second advice is focus definitely um, primarily on rights and equality, like the unfair taxation and, uh, and so on. So with that, you can't do wrong. And that's uh, um, because it is unfair and unjust to tax uh, a, a, a basic necessity. And thirdly, if you want to make an additional case for reducing the cost, first understand the market and your current tax system so you know what you ask for. And then we say yes and, which means consider accountability and compliance mechanisms to really make sure the reduction, uh, the tax reduction is passed through. That could be um, uh, pressuring producers and large retailers to make public commitments. And that was, for example, the case we've seen here in Germany. Um, and then they have to follow through. Um, a price indicated on the product packaging could also be a very simple mechanism. And lastly, making clear laws uh, and hold in uh, like the government government's role of making producer and retailers comply. Right, David? Yeah, I would say this this uh, point is a very important one to create transparency and to make others accountable to really pass through, um, so that we can avoid yeah. the pitfalls we. Just discuss yeah before. and then just lastly i really want to quickly run through there are further creative measures um such as uh having uh, a funds like in uk like a tampon tax funds or right retailers covering the vat removal and you can always consider advocating for additional or alternative policy tools okay that's it for our presentation i want to make uh, enough time for the case studies you will get all this information later on on the website that we're publishing. Um, yeah, now handing over to uh, case studies and our next presentation will be from, can you skip the slide? From Aaron Dati. Okay, thanks Ina, that was um, great. We know that we have several questions on the chat box, but if you could just hold on for another 15 minutes and we'll finish off our country case studies and we'll, uh, we'll get to all the questions. Um, so, just a quick preview of what happened in India. So India in 2017, uh, the government announced that there would be 12% um, goods and services tax, which is a kind of VAT on sanitary pad. Um, and this created a lot of hue and cry by activists across the country. And in response to this, we had a member of parliament who launched a large campaign um, asking the finance minister to exempt sanitary pads from the goods and services tax. This went on for about a year um, with a lot of uh, campaigning online, offline. Um, and in 2018, about uh, a little over a year after the government imposed this 12% tax, the government then made sanitary pads um, exempt from uh, tax. Um, However, um, if we could just press the key again, 
um, where uh, what we're finding is that our conversations with um, manufacturers suggest small and mid scale um, suggest that uh, in fact the tax exemption has not made products cheaper nor has it necessarily made them more available to those who uh, need them the most and also have the least amount of resources to um, buy them so here below is a newspaper cutting um, uh, and it, it's as to why the tax exemption is actually a populist measure and it kind of explains why um, exactly what Ina had discussed before, the importance of understanding the tax structure in your country um, and this whole concept of input tax credit and whether that will still be applicable if you have tax exemption versus zero tax. So um, that's the, the, so India in fact, um, over the past year, uh, and we'll have Jaydeep, uh, 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 an important manufacturer in the country really talk about the impact but we haven't seen a great tax reduction. Um, some of us have asked uh, in India pushing for actually more progressive taxation or a more um, responsive taxation that allows for a more equal playing field for other types of products, which include compostable, disposable sanitary pads, but also reusable cloth pads as well as menstrual cups. Um, so now we will go proceed next to um, Bangladesh, where we have, um, oh, sorry. Uh, to uh, uh, Tanzania. Um, so, uh, yes, so Tanzania, you're up next. Hold on and we'll unmute you. Oh. Who's doing this? Who's unmuting Priya? Yeah, okay. Priya, you're Okay, yeah. we get? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I um, hope you're all well. That was a really interesting presentation on how VAT works. So thank you for that. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of some of the work we've been doing in Tanzania. Um, so I think most people know we have like a coalition in Tanzania, the Menstrual Hygiene Management Coalition, which comprises of um, maybe over 50, 60 organizations uh, in Tanzania that are in some capacity or another working on menstrual hygiene. Um, so Tanzania has been celebrating the Menstrual Hygiene Day since around like 2016. And it kind of started off um, quite quiet with a few actors being involved. Um, and then kind of as it gained more attention, more and more people started to get involved. Um, and the issue of tax was, you know, being talked about and kind of always on the agenda, but I think we never really had kind of the loud voice and uh, the push for it. So in 2018, uh, for the Menstrual Hygiene Day, all the organizations came together and we decided to put all our efforts together and, and create a coalition. And we had a big event in Dodoma where we had the Ministry of Health um, and the, the guest of honor who was the Minister of Deputy Minister of Health at the time. Um, and at that event, we had different presentations, different exhibitions, things like that. And we presented to government a case to remove the VAT on sanitary pads. We had a number of advocacy asks, um, but that was just uh, one of them. And the idea behind it obviously was to bring down the prices of pads uh, to make them more affordable for the, the poorest in society and the most vulnerable um, so that women are able to access products and, and deal with their periods in a way because in uh, Tanzania, people are still using materials which are unhygienic and, and they're not safe. So that was um, the idea behind it. And shortly after the event in Dodoma, uh, the Ministry of Finance announced the decision to remove the VAT. So they do the budget um, announcements around July and we had our event in May. So it seemed as though this wasn't the only thing that contributed, but it was definitely kind of the big push um, that we needed and to put that advocacy ask out there. Um, but as you mentioned, it wasn't as simple as that. And I think... Um, one of the areas the coalition, uh, I don't want to say we made a mistake on, but what we didn't look at was 
what may happen after the VAT exemption. We just ask government to do something without really maybe doing some research into what would happen or to what else needed to happen um, in collaboration with the VAT exemption to bring the prices down. So we kind of relaxed when that had happened, you know, we all cheered. And then maybe like eight to nine months, 10 months, we started seeing and government seeing that prices were not going down. And then there started to be kind of whispers of that the VAT might come on. So there was kind of initial research done by an organization called i for id um, into the market. Um, and they found that some, some of the companies, like always the kind of international companies, had seen a small reduction in prices. Um, but for the most part, it, it wasn't very significant. And some of the other um, companies, there wasn't, uh, wasn't a reduction. Um, so some of the research, I mean, as you said, was that the profit was being made along the supply chain line, mostly at the, the retail level. So retailers were not um, lowering their prices. Um, and yeah, again, as, as the reason part of that is because it's not a very highly competitive market at the moment, um, sanitary pads are not they're not as uh, big as they could be in the market it could be uh, with the amount of women and the amount of girls menstruating they could be selling a lot more but the competition is not there so uh, product sales are slow stock turnover can take a long time and it's not reaching its potential which can cause retailers to keep the prices up because they're not if they keep the prices low, they're not going to be making enough maybe to make it profitable. And also, like you said, the, the issue of transportation, um, most of these pads are being sold at the small shops. So you only have certain distribution lines which hike the cost up. Um, and we also found that there wasn't like awareness that the VAT exemption had happened. So consumers weren't really sure. And so they couldn't, um, you know, demand prices or go in and, and look for competition or more people going to buy pads because they thought the price would be lower. Um, so it was kind of a general lack of awareness among consumers, but also among retailers over what had happened and then what could be done in order to lower the prices. So it was quite a few different issues. Um, and what we thought was that the VAT exemption could still work, but it just needs to be done in conjunction with other things like potentially national campaigns around these sorts of products, working with private sector and retailers to bring the price down or having like a cap on prices that maybe the government could introduce and also looking at national um, distribution channels as a way to like bring the price down. Um, so when we heard the VAT exemption was happening, we launched very quickly a campaign called Paddy Bila Kodi, um, asking the government to keep it on. And we had um, celebrities get involved. We basically, you can see in the picture, had this sign and we went round and got celebrity and, and social media influencers and activists to pose and to post on social media. And it did get, um, you know, international media attention and national media attention. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't really enough um, to keep it off. But as you said, Ina, it was quite good as just a way to keep raising awareness of um, these issues in the country and to show it's an issue of importance. Um, Bri, I just need to come to a close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're, but we're continuing to lobby on the issue and continuing the research is how I'll finish it. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I think that's a really ex extremely important learning case for all of us in low and middle income country and even if you suffered. Okay, next presentation uh, we have uh, from Bangladesh. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ina and all others and all the participants. Uh, I hope to finish it by five minutes and uh, definitely um, let's try, let me give it a try. So let me start uh, with our standing point. 
where we, I mean, what we really believe from core of our heart. Because uh, from the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1979, Article 1 is the basic point in our footsteps towards this tax exemption effort. And according to that you know, uh, adoption and statement, taxing products used primarily or even exclusively by women is to tax them on the basis of their sex, something which is prohibited by international human rights norms. And that's why we believe that safe period is every woman's health right and that tax is a barrier to access and affordability. So um, with such point, according to our context, very recently we have uh, uh, finished our national hygiene survey 2018. This is a government-led um, uh, survey done by the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics and while Water Aid works also together with this institution. And we found that 43% adolescent girls and 29% adult women use disposable sanitary napkin during their menstruation. But um, in parallel, uh, last year, for, from the last one year, we did a lot of research works on this issue, um, how this tax has been occurred, and, and I'm happy to see uh, today that the lawyer has expressed the whole value chain of where the tax can be come from and how can we move on. And um, yeah, those are also the part of today's discussion also. But uh, we found from our research that the total TTI on the sanitary napkin is 127%. At the last uh, in a minute, I will brief this, this burden of tax issue. But uh, what we felt, it shouldn't be the tax on these um, uh, sanitary napkins. That's why we did a lot of research and uh, make a policy brief and submit to the National Board of Revenue, who actually sets the you know, back tax on every product in Bangladesh. And um, once we did a lot of effort and, uh, and get the commitment from the government, and last year, during 30th June 2019, an SRO, which is just an amendment of short of thing in the budget statement, in the national budget statement, an SRO was published. And um, it was mentioned that uh, all the necessary back tax uh, on this entry napkin are waived. Wow, what a success uh, what we believed at that time. But uh, instantaneously after that, we felt that uh, we need to, uh, you know, the journey has just begun actually, because there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding by the government's point of view, from the NBA's point of view, and from our point of view, from the right angle, rights issue. Um, NBS point of view is to create some job market. Uh, that's why they have set uh, some target to create some job market and to give this exemption to new industries who can invest more than 8.25 million US dollar. Wow, that's an absurd case. If a new investment, even though the big investment only for the sanitary napkin will not be more than 2.35 million US dollar. That's the maximum. So. If we really calculate such, you know, um, these things, this sort of investment is really impossible for this uh, um, sanitary napkin market, newly market, and this SRO becomes uh, uh, no use at all. Furthermore, we did a lot of advocacy and still it is going on, but I am really, uh, can't myself resist to, you know, uh, say something about the best structure. Something like that in Bangladesh, we need to ex import the, you know, all the raw materials of this that uh, sanitary napkins and um, as in the previous presenter has mentioned, the fluff pulp and cotton and all others, we need to import it. And it's not easy to identify which one is to be used for the, um, you know, sanitary napkin. So let's say hundred dollars, you know, raw materials have been imported and it goes, uh, once we, uh, you know, import $100, um, uh, you know, uh, raw materials, we need to pay 127.84% TTI. So it becomes $227.84 immediately before going to the production house, that means in an industry. And in the industry, after getting, you know, all the productions, manufacturers, uh, and when the sanitary napkins uh, gets the final production, once it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, went out, gone out from uh, the production house, that means industry, it gives a 15% local tax. And when it goes to the local market, 
then uh, we need to the consumer need to pay more three percent more sell tax also so i mean these all are the tax structure but from our issue is to at least even if we reduce this 15 percent vat from the local you know consumers then the consumers end will be benefited and that's why we are now doing the advocacy with the local with the, with the government keeping the safe period of uh, you know uh, as a women's health issue and the right issue and I, we believe that a long journey need to be paved away i will discuss more during the question and answer thank you so much abdullah ji thank you um, and thank you so much for this um, so we'll move on to um, Clements uh, to talk about the Zimbabwe case. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so for Zimbabwe, the past three years have been uh, interesting, as it saw various uh, men's health management stakeholders trying to vary variables to try and see uh, what can work and what may not work. So what we did, uh, we first tried to define uh, the people were going to benefit from our lobbying. So we divided uh, them into two groups, uh, women and girls who menstruate but, and who earn an income and can be able to pay for sanitary way if it is made affordable. Then we also looked at another group composed of women and girls who menstruate but uh, won't be able to pay for sanitary way even if uh, tax is reduced. So examples include the homeless, uh, female prisoners, as well as uh, uh, refugees. So our campaign strategies were informed by this. And in terms of uh, the activities uh, and the actual strategies that, that we implemented, uh, they include lobbying, lobbying, uh, especially during times when government will be uh, crafting legislation or formulating policies, such as the national budget or even the laws. I can give an example of the Education Act, which was uh, promulgated last year. Uh, one of the uh, issues that, that, that we lobbied for to be included in the Education Amendment Bill before it was uh, promulgated into a law was to say, we want uh, a, a provision to say there's going to be free provision of sanitary way to all girls in, 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 in schools. So it was a, a, an issue of debate in parliament with, with government saying it can't afford, but eventually they said yes to it. Then there were also petitions to parliament that were submitted, that was, that, that were submitted by different organizations, uh, including the Happy Flow campaign that was being uh, run by uh, Katsuka Sisterhood. And us at Santa Aid Zimbabwe, we also uh, did a, a very successful petition where 3,200 signatures were garnered, and we also submitted it uh, to Parliament. Then we also were lobbying around uh, increasing awareness about uh, period poverty to encourage action, because what we saw was that uh, many people were just treating it as a light issue, as something that uh, is not even uh, uh, impacting women and uh, the humanity at large. So we, we, we really raised awareness uh, to, uh, via uh, various media platforms such as the radio, uh, writing articles, as well as other means. And we're also doing a lot of poly policy analysis to try and identify the policy gaps and also to inform uh, government where possible. Then in parliament as well, we realized that uh, even the parliamentarians themselves were also beginning to see the, the message and they're also now moving motions to say, we want uh, our, our girls uh, to have free sanitary way. Then in terms of uh, the intervention that then we then realized from government and the various uh, authorities after that, the first one was with respect to uh, imported finished sanitary, uh, sanitary way, where in the 2018 uh, national budget, government then removed customs duty on imported sanitary way. Initially, it was ab about uh, 15%, so they had to, to, to uh, exempt it. Then as well, there was also a value-added tax uh, attached to imported sanitary way of 15%. It was also removed by, uh, by, 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 by government through the, the, the national budget. Then there was also another intervention that they also uh, uh, implemented, that, that of uh, imported raw materials, because we also had about five local producers of uh, sanitary way in Zimbabwe. So the import 
up about 70 percent of their raw materials from outside the country from countries such as south africa and china so normally the duty they pay for the different raw materials that they import ranges from between five to ten percent so that uh, duty was also uh, removed for raw materials then you also lobbied as i indicated earlier that apart from tax we know that the tax component will only, will only benefit those who will be able to pay but there are also groups of women who are not any girls who, who, who cannot afford to pay for center even if duty is reduced to zero so that's when we we lobbied through the education act to say uh, let there be a free sanitary way for those who cannot have, for all groups of women and, and girls who do not afford to to to, to pay for it so we, we then saw in the 2020 national budget that government then uh, announced a fund of 200 million zimbabwean dollars uh, which is also equal to about 12.5 million uh, us dollars this fund will then cater for for starting from this year for free sanitary way for girls in rural, in rural schools so they are already starting to discuss the modalities around it, how it's going to be Im implemented then in terms of what happened post uh, the reduction of taxes uh, just for, you have 10 seconds left so <laughs> i give you another right, minute, but please uh, yeah, wrap please. up <laughs> Clement. Th th all right all right thank you so much then in terms of what, what happened post reduction we did not see any reduction in 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 take in the price of sanitary way after the the reductions in in both customs duty and VAT mainly because of the because that the tax component was only one driver of the cost of the of, of the sanitary way other drivers were, were, were things such as the utilities transportation the rentals for for the for the retailers which which all increased we've seen inflation in Zimbabwe rising to about 600 percent right now and even the price of sanitary pays have increased from from one dollar to 31 dollars at the moment and also in terms of the local lo local companies because of the uh, removal of duty they were then facing competition from 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 uh, important words so they started to to close down we, we've seen them closing down from about five companies to, to only two companies that are now operating of which the existing ones that are operating right now they're operating at low capacity then uh, in terms of the lessons learned maybe just stepping up 30 seconds in terms of the lesson that we learned number one was that uh, i think uh, as activists, we don't have to just copy and paste a uh, strategy that have worked in other countries because there are differences in, in terms of the economic uh, uh, architecture of one country to another. For ours in Zimbabwe, we, 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 we're facing a bit of uh, instability and prices are, are, are moving. And if we were to just rely on taxes alone, uh, inflation would just come and wipe out all the, uh, uh, the, the benefits that you, you would have lobbied for. So, in brief, that's, that's what, what I can say for now. Thank you so much, uh, Clement. So we'll um, quickly move on to Kasha and to Akar Innovation. So I'd request Natasha as well as Jayadeep to keep the interventions brief. We know that we definitely want to hear from retailers and manufacturers. But highlight the key points. Um, so sit behind you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the other presenters. Presenters, because uh, now we're thinking what Rwanda has been really doing and. I feel a little bit ashamed because we don't really did much in terms of advocacy around tax exemption. So the, a little bit of background, Rwanda has now done the tax exemption last month, December. And so, so far there's no really big change, but we see as a retailers, we see some changes from the suppliers. So for, but, but only local suppliers. So we have seen a, a decrease in prices around 14% which I think is a good start, but it's not really that big. And I think one of the things that as retailers we have seen is that it's not only about the price, but also the way we deliver and distribute the, the, the products. And we have limited uh, uh, platforms where people can access martial products. And I think this has been really a challenge in our country now. And apart from that, also what we deliver, how do we deliver it? And what information do we put on, on the products we are delivering. And so I, I think from, from, from what I had, of course, we have been doing some small, small campaigns, uh, not on the country level, but small campaigns to, because we now work directly with the supplier to make sure also it's not that expensive, which I think is really important because when you go to go now for the other retailers, then at the end on our platform, it will be really expensive. 
So what we do now is we go directly to the manufacturers and they give us directly the, 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 the price, then we just add a small margin. But I think what is really important is those, even those manufacturers don't really understand why this is important. And we have seen it where, where we want to do some small campaigns in schools or campaigns in, even in women prisons because that's also another vulnerable, vulnerable area. And we have seen that they are really reluctant to provide on a smaller price, but also even to provide some free pads for campaigns. And we have seen that it's really, really hard. And I, I think as business uh, operators, it's also hard to just give up for free. So we have seen that there is, there is no correlation between what advocates, policymakers, and the business owners, there's no really um, the same understanding. And, and I think it's because the way the message are portrayed and the way the message are sending out. So like, for example, in Rwanda, we have one good campaign where people were on social media talking about tax exemption. And I think that's where actually the, 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 the idea came from. So there was no really a coalition on or people getting together to really see if this is something can move forward. And I think that, 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 that thing really made it a little bit, uh, not that seen as important as it is. And so as business owners and business operators, it's really has, has been really a tough, a tough situation. And we think this is a good step. It's a good step that the tax are exempted and it's gonna be definitely is, we see that it's now starting that people are now uh, reducing the price, but because it's new, so it's still, people are seeing that they have, still have a stock that they bought um, previously, so they cannot easily uh, reduce the prices. But I, I think we need more apart from that because tax exemption is one thing, but also are we really sure that it's gonna really reduce price enough to make sure that those people who are vulnerable can now afford. Thanks, yeah. Thanks yeah. Natasha, Thank for you. that. Um, Jadeep, as the only manufacturer on this call, it will be great to hear your views of how India's um, tax exemption has affected uh, our car innovations. Jadeep, uh, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, sorry, we'll unmute yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sarandhati. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. So yeah, so I'm the only manufacturer. So I'll try to talk about uh, what is the scenario in India as of now on the manufacturing side, both on small as well as large. Um, so I just uh, mentioned initially some of the materials which are in used for making sanitary pads on a general basis and the, and the GST. So in India, uh, some of you may be aware, uh, instead of the VAT and CST system, which were there earlier, now uh, government have introduced one single tax slab, which is called, sorry, not slab, one single tax, which is called goods and services tax called GST. And it's applicable for all the products and services, but some of the cases it is zero. Some of the cases it has been, there is a amount which is being charged. So for uh, typically for sanitary pad raw materials, their taxes are between 12% and 18%. And initially the, the uh, sanitary pads, what uh, GST was at 12%. Then after the campaign, it was gone down to zero. Now, now, how does this affect in the income, the production cost, and also to the consumer cost? Now, uh, because it's a zero uh, tax right now on sanitary pads, uh, so uh, the, what is happening is that the input credit, which was like so, when as a manufacturers uh, we buy the raw materials from uh, vendors, so we have to pay this uh, all these materials between twelve percent to eighteen percent GST. Now, uh, in case uh, earlier when, let's say, if the, uh, the output tax, which is the uh, sales tax from the finished product was on 12%, so then it was kind of balancing because you are paying 12% and you're passing on the 12%, so it is getting balanced somehow. So, but right now what is happening is that we are paying uh, the, uh, in terms of raw materials, but then we are not able to take benefit while we cannot pass it on to the consumers. So what is happening is that uh, although regulations are not that strict, so what was supposed to happen uh, on this was so all companies should have reduced the uh, the price because now we cannot charge this uh, twelve percent uh, GST. It should be zero, but it didn't happen actually in the practical because uh, companies started charging this uh, the burden of the tax, which is we are paying on the raw material side. To the consumers so ultimately uh, in some cases there are two scenarios here for the very large manufacturers who have like companies like pngs or jngs and all they have like thousands of products they produce and different products have different uh, 
tax uh, slabs, uh, especially GST. So that can be passed on uh, uh, in other products, whereas the GST is there. Whereas in case of small manufacturers like us or even like the village level, so we, uh, we have to pay this GST on the raw material side. But then because we are selling only single product, so and it, which is a zero tax, so we cannot pass it on that. So it is building up and up. And then obviously, like, so if this is happening, so we will be making loss because the margins are anyway low. So what is happening is that we have to add this cost of input credit to the consumers and the cost actually have gone up a bit. Uh, from the earlier cost. Uh, so this is the scenario here in terms of normal manufacturing paths. We, uh, on the other case, which uh, we specialize as organizations, uh, we make the compostable paths, uh, certified compostable. And in, in this case, we have to uh, import some of the materials from outside India, especially from US and Europe, Germany uh, and all. So in these cases, we are actually paying import duty on those materials, which is between 25 to 47% which is too much actually and there is no exemptions at all there wherever we are selling a green product we are paying more more than even like the what other manufacturers uh, normal manufacturers are paying and on the product side obviously our cost uh, our people expect to be at par with the other uh, products which cannot be and we we had to charge more for that so this is the challenges up here so uh what is our suggestions is that like uh, <clears throat> Uh, for the for the green products, it would be like sanitary pads or other other products which are there. Like uh, it should be the the taxes on the raw materials also should be exempted as well as for the uh, outside. Or for the and in case of the normal pads, it should not be zero, but then it should be somewhere in between. Uh, whereas it's balanced. Otherwise, the actual cost of the product is not getting down for for the end consumers. It is just being there, and either it is small less or it is more than that what it is right now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Adip. It's fabulous to hear um, a manufacturer deconstruct how tax, um, zero tax, tax exemption ha has affected um, the cost of uh, production as well as the final product that's passed on to consumers. Um, we're, uh, we're a little behind time, but we're going to um, open this up uh, for a quick discussion. We see there are several comments and questions in the chat box, but if anyone would like to make comments, please raise your hand. We'll unmute you so that you can quickly make your comment. We'll keep going for another five to seven minutes and then we'll um, wrap up. Uh, so uh, please raise your hand if you have any comments. Okay. To raise your hand. Few comments uh, in the chat box, and we can just go over those. So uh, some of the some of the discussion points that are coming out are that you know taxation may have had uh, a, a certain price reduction in some countries, but it's certainly not enough. Uh, lack of awareness through national campaigns, through you know larger distribution channel and retail intervention still needs to be targeted. Um, also, uh, ensuring quality control and safety of users is also a big uh, issue. And so addressing that becomes a parallel issue while looking at the tax. Um, also, okay, so the questions are, how can we measure in the product supply chain the transmission of taxes from one level to the other until the MHM product reaches the end user? Um, so I am... I'm unmuting our uh, speakers. Any of you who want to, you know, respond to this question, please. Uh, yeah. yeah, it should easily be possible because. In, Just say we are. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, yeah, we are uh, from Western Germany, and I'm David. Um, it should already be possible because you can always see the gross and net prices already, mm -hmm. and. All that should be the price in future should always only be the net price and not the gross price. And you, mm -hmm. could, you should be able to see that at every stage already. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, also, the next question is, um, how can we ensure that retailers pass the benefit to the consumers? Um, if anyone would want to answer this. How can we ensure that the VAT reduction uh, or the exemption and the benefit of that is actually passed to consumers across the supply chain? Um, 
I think Ina pointed it out quite well in the in the beginning. So um, if you see her suggestions for campaigning, I think it was step three, which was the most important mm -hmm. one. So many of you who do campaigning already explained that transparency is very important and you need to involve mm -hmm. as many people as possible, I think. So you need to involve the manufacturers, the retailers, but also the public so that the mm -hmm. public is aware that they should now pay less. I think that's from my side. I think the people really involved in not only in thinking, I, but also in campaigning should add to that. Yes, and I think that the I other point add, that... I want to add, Arundhati, a few points um, from David has mentioned. I mean, in order to reach the benefits of the consumers, I think uh, we need to fix, uh, you know, some of the um, campaigns first to raise the voice, as David has mentioned. But in addition to that, we need to have the baseline study of the current scenario of this, you know, price of this sanitary napkin or these products also. What, I mean, um, if we have the, you know, baseline for this study, I don't know whether any country has this level of study or some economical analysis, uh, uh, considering the health benefits and environmental benefits and all others, if we if the price reduction has been done, but if we have that, so uh, and uh, in uh, we need to include also the manufacturers in this commitment and in this study together, so that you know the finally the commitment can be reached uh, uh, towards the end consumer. Oh, uh, can I add something also? Uh, I think maybe uh, I was thinking that maybe we also need to look at other angles, like how can we make sure that retailers are accountable? And like Rwanda has done that with, with pharmaceutical products. And I think it's time you also look at that way and look how can we, if maybe it's, maybe if wholesale is this amount, then you cannot go beyond 20% of margin. I think we need to go to that level of discussions where we, because I think just let it go for the retailers to decide has been really, we will in ways be a challenge because they want to, to benefit and sometimes they don't understand the reason why we're pushing the agenda. So I think maybe moving from now thinking of uh, just providing information advo advocacy, but also look into really sustainable strategy that can really work within the policy frameworks. Um, th thank you. All right. Like, uh, we, yeah, please go ahead. All right. Uh, if I can come in, I also wanted just to quickly make another point to say it is also important to specify, uh, even in the lobbying, which uh, sanitary item was normally, as we've seen in Zimbabwe, when we were lobbying, main, main, many of the campaigns were just uh, focusing on sanitary pads and uh, mm. tambour. Even when, when government intervened, they only removed the duty and VAT on sanitary pads and tampons, leaving other sustainable uh, uh, mm, solutions such yeah. as menstrual cups as well as uh, period underwear. So we, we later realized, and we actually had to then intervene to, to yeah. lobby again this year, last year for the 2020 budget to say, but you left this uh, uh, product as well. Then they said, but you, you did highlight us. We just uh, assumed that these are the. the the ones that, that we always see in the shops or on the shelves, we always see the sanitary pays and 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 the tampons. Mm -hmm. So we need to also uh, increase education around all the sanitary types that need to be, you know, a, a, a brought in, in into the picture. Thank you. So, Clement, I think you made a really, really good point. I think it's important that in campaigning, we also use this as an opportunity um, to talk about the importance of uh, a woman and a girl's right to choose whichever product that she wants and therefore to also ask for um, uh, reduced tax on other products such as menstrual cups, various types of cloth pads, menstrual underwear, et cetera, that are available uh, in several countries. So it's a very critical point that you brought up. Not just about sanitary pads, but other menstrual hygiene products that may be available uh, for sale in those countries. So thanks for it. Thank you. I have a similar question on the topic of disposable versus disposable. Exemption for usable products. So, you know, like the discussion has been, it's primarily been focused on disposable sanitary pads and tampons. So, I think there is a way forward in which we look at a more 
uh, sort of holistic uh, approach to tax advocacy where we are looking at uh, all possible products to offer informed choice to consumers uh, and also their raw materials like jadeep mentioned it's important to look at the the you know upstream uh, supply yeah. chain as well and uh, another question tatiana you had was for those of us working in countries in which mhm movement is relatively new and tax exemption is still uh, way the way for what are the best ways to engage with key government stakeholders on the topic um, um uh, oh arundhati you wanted to no, go ahead okay so basically i think uh, tax exemption is one method mm -hmm. of advocacy but even having the government look at it from a perspective of awareness on menstrual health positioning it uh, you know developing the narrative on uh, the impact of it from a gender equity from a rights perspective from a wash education all of these perspectives will just at least uh, start to ensure that there is funding allocated on awareness on these issues and slowly it can be built up into tax advocacy and supply chain advocacy So, um, any we'll we'll just take another last comment or two before we wrap up. So, if anyone, yeah, if there are no questions, I actually had a couple of uh, questions uh, points actually. So, I think this also came up from the discussion that uh, you know there are some implications for imports across different settings also because uh, what we've uh, not looked at necessarily in this entire. Um, uh you know movement till now is uh, that a lot of the raw materials especially wood pulp which is the primary raw material is imported and that market is uh, is pretty much you know a few global suppliers and so possibly looking at you know alternative fibers uh, and local local uh, sort of industries around alternative fibers is another supply chain intervention that could be looked at um also uh, in terms of uh, um, yeah waste so again you know one issue was reusable products but also um how can we look at tax advocacy through a life cycle lens of the product rather than at the point where it is purchased by the consumer so tax not just at the raw material distribution marketing and uh, you know trade level but also after the, the the product is used and disposed how it's managed what's the cost to the consumer for that and especially in low and middle income countries where waste infrastructure is limited the cost is disproportionately borne by children and women so those questions i think still remain a little unaddressed in the tax advocacy movement and hopefully uh, it will evolve to be uh, you know evolve to cover all these points as well yeah so um Uh, so we're going to bring this web dialogue to a close. Uh, thank you all for joining. Do stay tuned. Um, uh, Ina and the Wash United team are working hard to set up a new portal where more information on this and greater dialogue on the issue of tax across countries um, will be encouraged. To a uh, big thank you to Ina and Wash United for doing that. So stay tuned. Um, in terms of next steps we will be sharing uh, the presentation that has been made the contacts of all those who have spoken as well um we will be sharing this with uh, with everyone um and uh, we look forward to having you join us for the next web dialogue which will be in february so thank you and have a great day to all thank you Thank you very much everyone to the presenters speakers participants and moderators thank you